We're back, we're live, and we have the joy of talking to Lou Pugliarisi of Eprink. He's the CEO in Washington, D.C. by Skype, and he looks great. Let's have a flash on Lou, just to show you what I'm there. He looks great. Welcome back to the show, Lou. Lou, Lou Pugliarisi, CEO of Eprink, yeah? <laughs> nice to be here, Jay. Yeah, we were talking about the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum Energy, Clean Energy Day. It's in the last part of August. I'm going to say uh, the last week in August, and it's just before Labor Day. And uh, it's a popular event. It takes place every year, sometime in the summer. It's at uh, the Laniakea uh, YWCA meeting room, which is quite large. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the... You know, leaders of energy, all kinds of energy leaders in Hawaii uh, participate and appear. So, uh, Lou, you're coming, and if you're going to be here in that week, uh, that would be fabulous. And in fact, in one hour from now, um, we'll be having our, and you can watch it if you like, uh, the state of clean energy, talk about solar and uh, so, you know, solar, um, uh, so, you know, technology issues at four o'clock Hawaii time. And those people are brought to us by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, so uh, we can we can actually um, talk about you. <laughs> so, Lou, in your in your role as a Washington Beltway person who follows policy, and that means following all the things that go on in Washington, including things that we like and some of the things we don't like. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of issues we need to talk about today. Uh, one is uh, the, the Paris Agreement. Last time we spoke, a couple of weeks ago, it's funny how things move so fast. Last yeah. time we spoke, th that decision had not been made. It was suggested but not made. And since yeah. then, it's been made, and we've seen all kinds of fallout and, and feedback and <laughs> what you would call resistance, if you will, all around not only the country but the world. And I uh, wonder what your thoughts are about that. Uh, about the reasons for the decision as it is and the reasons for the fallout. So I, I think the um, political reasons for it were, are several. Part of it is uh, based on this view that the U.S. has entered into some kind of agreement in which we will carry a lot of the burden of reducing uh, carbon dioxide emissions and the other big emitters, India and China, will not. Now, that's a kind of complicated calculation. We've been uh, we've been producing CO2 in the atmosphere a bit longer than they have. They, uh, but I think there was a sense that it is true that the agreement, as specified, by the way, which was not. Uh, a treaty agreement or any kind of enforceable agreement. That's very clear. There were two or three things about the agreement that were clear. One, um, it will have no effect using the IPC, the UN models. It will have no effect on temperature. So its, it's agreement was an agreement to get started, really. It didn't really have any, everybody would agree that uh, if you ran the IPCC models, even if you didn't believe in them, they had no effect. So that, that's very important. The second point is, is that the U.S. was putting a lot of money into this uh, U.N. fund, this Global Energy Clean Fund, and uh, that money was put in in the absence of any sort of consensus or treaty agreement from the Senate. So I think there was a lot of concern about that. It was kind of general assistance to the U.N., which the Obama administration diverted there. And then I think there was a third piece people don't talk about, which is, Yes, it was unenforceable, but under U.S. law, in which many environmental groups can enter on through the civil procedures of these laws, they could compel various, uh, they can compel the EPA or compel the U.S. government to enforce certain provisions of the, of the Clean Power Plan, even though they're not enforceable under the agreement. Mm -hmm. So I felt the, the administration felt that if they had gone forward with it, it would have undermined all their commitments to their basic groups. Uh, there has been a huge fallout from, as you point out, one of it is that the U.S. has uh, deferred or ceded its leadership in the environment to the Chinese, which 
on the face of it is kind of ridiculous when you look at the comparison of our two countries and on our environmental control system, particularly how well we do at air quality compared to the Chinese. So those are the kind of basic inside the beltway reasons for this. But the fallout from this, of course, you know, Governor Brown has gone to Beijing and he's entered into his own uh, international agreement with the Chinese. And, and there's a lot of this uh, action out there right now. <laughs> Well, you know, it's people, just a, a lot of people that. on the left, I would say, are very horrified by this. Yes, that would be true. It's just a footnote to that is that uh, his policy seems to be to make unilateral, or rather bilateral agreements, just uh, the U.S. and one country at a time, which is um, actually not what Obama was doing and not what earlier presidents were doing. I, I think he feels from a business point of view he can negotiate better deals because uh, you, you take uh, most countries and they are at a real serious disadvantage in negotiating with the Goliath, with, with, with the U.S. Yes, yeah, so I think there's, the, 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 you know, that, that really I think for the environment is not what the administration was talking about. I mean, in, in multilateral groups, they're talking about trade, where the smallest country dictates the policy for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. the weakest link. So I think that's a lot of the complaints about trade. Although, in my opinion, they, they have uh, learned that a lot of the concerns they raised, they raised about trade were overblown. I, I believe a lot of this stuff is not, you know, a lot of fundamental problems with our manufacturing sector in the U.S. is less tied to trade and more tied to uh, the skill of our labor force, the role of robotics and, and uh, manufacturing, regulatory programs. Trade is a piece of the problem, and trade only really affects a narrow sector within the economy. There's broad parts of the trade that are not a, that are not part of any of these agreements. In fact, Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce, appeared publicly on this very issue, saying, "Well, there's blameless trade deficits and kind of trade deficits in which somebody did something wrong." Mm -hmm. Yeah. And energy, he said, was a blameless trade deficit. Well, energy is really uh, energy is important, but you know, to me, there's a question as to whether pulling, well, to the extent, uh, the extent to which energy is affected by pulling out of the Paris Agreement, and it may not be directly affected, right? Uh, I mean, what, to uh, what extent so is energy under, affected? For, for example. Um, in the, in the U.S. system, the, 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 the federal, the U.S. government was doing several things, right? Not necessarily tied to Paris. One was they were putting a lot of money into alternative fuels and technology. They were uh, encouraging, and both state and federal government, subsidizing the deployment of electric cars, subsidizing the deployment of wind energy, and subsidizing the deployment of solar energy. Mm -hmm. And those programs, and also something we call renewable uh, portfolio standards in the utility sector, feed-in tariffs, all these kinds of things which encourage utilities to use uh, alternative uh, energy. That, that is largely left untouched by this, uh, this pulling out of Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, first, the uh, production tax credits, and those, those things run through a a sort of a, a legislative course that doesn't expire for two to three years. And most renewable portfolio standards are driven by the states. The president pulling out of, Kyo, out of Paris, for example, has no effect on Hawaii's uh, ambitious plans to go 100% renewable. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> He's not going to have, you know, where <clears throat> Hawaii can avoid uh, you know, his policies or anti-policies, uh, it will. Uh, it's in a number of states, uh, in the, you know, in the Pacific area that are taking that position and they're trying to do their own Paris Accord, aren't they? Right. Sure. But I mean, basically, if you think about what Hawaii should care about, the Trump policies of promoting uh, North American petroleum fuels, right? is likely to lead to continued downward pressure on oil prices. And not only that, because of some unique conditions, uh, continued jet, uh, discounting of jet fuel. So actually, no one will want to admit this, but probably the tourism business of Hawaii is going to benefit from Trump's policies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, and tourism is doing well here. 
Yeah. I must say, in fact, uh, there was an article in, was it this morning or yesterday, um, for the proposition that I think United or one of the big airlines uh, is increasing the number of tourist flights out here. So that, that uh, we're doing well. From North America or from the Asia? I think it's North America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting, interesting. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, but uh, let me ask you this though, and this is, uh, you know, sort of, a, sort, of a, mm. sort of a second degree on it. Mm. So, uh, obviously, he's, he's created a vacuum by backing out uh, an environmental and leadership background globally. He, he, he's created a lot of things by backing out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and this, vac this vacuum that he's created, you know, people are going to move into it. As Xi Jinping, although, you know, he, his skirts are not exactly clean. Uh, he's going to try to move into it, and I, you know, and uh, Putin so will try what, to move in as well. What specifically is he going to do? This is the interesting thing. No one really, it's like a lot of things in Washington, no one ever says, okay, tell me exactly what he's going to, how he's going to either rule the world or rule the environment. And, you know, I, 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 I and as I pointed out, if you take a look at just, let's start with air quality. You know, just let's take air quality. And I have a slide on that that I sent you. We, we can either show it or not. But if you look at the like the ten worst, maybe the eight to ten worst cities in China for something called particulate matter or PM 2.5, which is the size of the microns, it's it's a it's it's a very unhealthy thing. It, it contributes to smog, the ability not to see very far down the street because it's hazy. So. The worst cities in the U.S., the ones that are out of attainment by U.S. law, are just barely out of attainment. They're in the good to moderate category. The worst cities in China are out of attainment by an order of magnitude more than the U.S. cities. Mm -hmm. So we have put enormous effort into cleaning up our local atmosphere, right? And people confound that with CO2. If you listen to different discussions, they say, well, this is horrible. We're all going to die of a lung disease or something because Trump pulled out of, a client, out of the Paris Agreement. But our local pollution is controlled by the EPA and by state rules, which control emissions from smokestacks and tailpipes of automobiles, and then have special plans for local air quality districts which are out of attainment. So we, we actually have made enormous progress, and our air is, quote, clean. Well, but the EPA, you mentioned the EPA, he's taking the wings out of the EPA. Is it going to be able to do that going forward? All of those particular rules, the regulation of criteria pollutants, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, ozone, particulates, those are prescribed in law under the Clean Air Act. The big fight over CO2 was they went to Congress, the EPA went to Congress, and they were able to get the Supreme Court to say, yes, a colorless, odorless gas called CO2 is in fact a pollutant. This is where the big fight all started over this. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that two, two aspects of it. But it's, of course, it is not in itself a pollutant. CO2 makes plants grow and will not make you sick. So everything is based upon the loadings of CO2 in the environment, in the atmosphere, what it would do to the climate long term. Mm -hmm. And I think a failure to separate local air quality, local environmental standards, which are part of integrated into our whole legal and cultural framework, and climate, it's sort of gotten all mixed up. And Trump decided to separate the two. Yeah, but let me let me add one thought though, and that is this. Uh, so you know, okay, Xi Jinping cannot. Um, he, he he has a certain credibility problem because China is not all that clean, and I, I don't think that Russia is all that clean either. But it's not necessarily um, an environmental leadership. It's the apparent environmental leadership. It's organizing global agreements and organizing global conferences and making speeches and, and you know, carrying the flag for environment, even if you have a lot of work to do in your country. So, and, and I think that is, that is what's going to happen. Even, even if Xi Jinping does not, is not in a position to clean things up, he will be in a position to say that he will clean things up yeah, and he will, and he will at least talk to talk. talk. 
That's the very reason Trump got out of the agreement. <laughs> you can think about it, because he said, our emissions are falling, right? And they will continue to fall through 2030. China does not even begin to address its total loadings until 2030. Mm. And neither does India. And so his view is that's a bad deal. I don't want to be part of that deal. Yeah. You know, that deal doesn't require them to do anything. Now, the Chinese have a different story on that. But Yeah. So, well, you know, well, so how do you see it? I mean, how do you see it uh, affecting uh, the U.S. position on uh, not only environment, but energy in general? I mean, we, we do have a, a certain hegemony in this area, and uh, we, we have been the leader in both of these areas for a long time. Um, will the loss, will this vacuum that he's created, will the loss of, you know, what do you call it, moral leadership that he is, that he is developing here, uh, will that affect us economically over time? Uh, or, do you, or do you think that within his administration, whether it's four years or, oh my God, eight years, uh, will, 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 will uh, we, we not have an effect from what he's done? Well, I could see it's possible. The you know, U.S. is a huge elephant in the room, if you like. And so it's really hard to say, okay, we're going to punish the U.S. when we are now exporting a million barrels a day of crude oil, largely to Asia. We are uh, exporting four billion cubic feet a day to Mexico. We are importing large supplies of energy, electricity from Canada. So our, at least our energy sector is quite uh, integrated into the world market, and there's no evidence that's going to change. Uh, there is, a, as, I, as we talked about in the past, there is an initiative to expand U.S. LNG exports to the Pacific, and both China and China has said it is prepared to buy more LNG as a substitute for some of its use of coal. Mm -hmm. So there's an improvement. Yes, for coal. It's still fossil, but it's an improvement. Yeah, and actually, uh, the one issue that deals, the, the, the one aspect of natural gas is that there are no particulates. Mm -hmm. So in terms of contro uh, controlling the atmosphere with some of the more serious pollutants, natural gas is a very effective uh, strategy. As it I recall, the smog, but it doesn't help you with climate as much. As I recall, we spoke last. Uh, this is interesting. I, uh, I think you were anticipating one of the alternatives, and perhaps the more likely alternative was that uh, Trump would attempt to renegotiate the agreement. You know, accept, reject, renegotiate. And uh, you thought uh, it was only a day or two before he actually decided. Yeah. Uh, you thought that he would attempt to renegotiate. Well, he did. Yeah, that, that is, he did do that. That's a typical Washington thing that people always try to compromise because they don't want to do that. But he's obviously a different kind of character. And he was convinced. And, and my understanding is that the administrator of EPA, uh, Administrator Pruitt, and some of the folks in the White and Steve Bannon and other folks, they came to the president with lots of facts and figures. And Ivanka and Kush, Kushner and maybe Tillerson and some of the other folks who wanted to stay in the Paris Agreement, they came to him largely with emotional arguments. And he, he actually was quite impressed by the legal concerns and, and the hard facts he was given by the other folks. He says, look, I don't want to be part of this deal, but I'll leave it open to negotiating another one. Mm -hmm. Well, Lou, let's, uh, let's take a short break. We're going to take a break and move on to our next topic, and uh, that is the continuing failure of OPEC to raise oil prices. Uh, we're going to talk about the outlook for a base load, that is fuel oil costs, yeah. and whether they are going to continue to be modest and what effect that will have on world energy markets and on the U.S. That's Lou Pugliarisi. He's the CEO of EPRIC, an energy policy think tank in Washington. We'll be right back for more. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, 25 talk shows by 25 dedicated hosts every week, helping us to explore and understand the issues and events in and affecting our state. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. from 
from the Foundation for a Better Life. You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're talking to Lou Pugliarici across the miles. Uh, he is uh, the CEO of ePrink in Washington, D.C., and we're talking about uh, two very interesting energy issues that are, that are on the deck. One is the effect of the Paris, uh, the, the, the withdrawal from the Paris Accord a couple of weeks ago. And now we're going to talk about the, uh, the failure of OPEC to raise oil prices, the outlook for baseload fuel oil costs. Uh, those, those increases are going to be modest and not rising very much, and this puts more pressure on, on the Hawaiian dream, <laughs> uh, which is a distant dream, of 100% renewables in the near term, or at least by 2045. So, Lou, you know, can you talk about the OPEC, uh, OPEC decision and what caused it and how it affects things? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we went through a period in which uh, oil prices were quite high, as much as $140 a barrel. It caused a lot of turmoil in the U.S. and even in Hawaii. And I think that a lot of that is, it's really unfortunate, because governments, you know, because they have very short electoral cycles often, they behave on short-run information. And they, they can't really get their, they can't go to their constituents and say, look, the long run price over the next five to six years is not going to be that bad. So please don't throw me out of office tomorrow. Mm -hmm. People don't really don't have a lot of patience. They say, no, you need to fix this now. And so what has happened is after oil prices, in, in the period of time the oil prices ran up, ran up before the collapse in, say, 2013, 2014, production in the U.S. expanded. And I have a chart there, just, but we went up from a relatively modest production and by uh, 2015, middle 20, 2014, 15, we were almost at the, one of the highest peaks, over 9 million barrels a day. The price fell. But uh, they went down to 20, 30. It's now recovered to as high as uh, 58, 60. It's now around 45. It's fallen back. Mm -hmm. And in that period, the U.S. has done two things. It's drastically cut its cost of production. It's drastically improved its technology application to the oil field. Mm -hmm. And U.S. production is rising again. Mm -hmm. At the same time, OPEC is not getting the demand. They're getting demand. World oil demand is growing by over a million barrels a day. But there's a lot of oil in the world. And the dream of raising oil prices to 60 or $70 a barrel is going to be put off for a bit longer. How, how much longer would you say? When can we expect to see it climb up again? I think that some of us have to accept that it's now quite possible that the long run price of oil is going to be closer to $50 than it is 70 mm -hmm. And that. Uh, Sure, we'll go through some perturbations and ups and downs, and this is going to put enormous pressure on the Saudis and the Middle East producers, but lots of parts of the world, including the U.S. and Mexico now, Argentina, other places, are learning how to produce this shale oil at relatively low cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, as the, as the Middle East producers have pulled out of Asia, the U.S. has begun exporting uh, very large volumes of crude oil to that part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, and, and uh, you haven't mentioned the effect of LNG on this. LNG so has a depressing effect, effect on the it, price of oil. Exactly. It? LNG pro provides there's two problems. When the price of oil falls, the incentive to move away from oil to LNG is declines because the cost savings aren't there. But if you look at Mexico, it's a good, a good example. Natural gas can be transported by pipeline to Mexico at very low cost. Mm -hmm. And we have a very open border. And almost all of the natural gas going into Mexico, which is a massive amount, is backing out the kinds of uh, base load fuel oil electric generation you see in Hawaii. So Mexico is replacing all its highly polluting, very expensive fuel oil, uh, power generation with natural gas from the U.S. Mm -hmm. and so it eats, this, that eats into the market as far as uh, yeah. uh, oil is concerned. Yeah, and that lowers oil demand. The other thing is, is that um, the, the, the traditional growth in diesel fuel seems to be abating, and the world fuel 
that's growing the most these days. It's not electric cars, but gasoline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, more cars. Gasoline so, me, is out, out, outperforming diesel, even in Asia, which was traditionally a very big diesel market. As, as long as people feel there's a supply of gasoline at prices they can somehow afford, they're, they're going to prefer, I think, uh, gas cars to electric cars because electric cars are generally more expensive, especially if you don't have a tax credit on it or if the tax yeah. credit is declining. But let me, let me ask you this. I mean, what, what, did, what, what do you think happened in Saudi Arabia when Trump was there? Uh, they're a big player in OPEC. Uh, they are looking maybe for guidance, uh, maybe to want to know how the, the great leader in energy, the United States, uh, uh, wants them to move. Does he tell them something? What position would he have taken? No, I think they, I, I'm almost sure this was hardly discussed. I believe the big benefit to the Saudis and the Persian Gulf states, uh, except for Gutter, of course, was that uh, he, he agreed to restore the U.S. traditional relationship, of course, in Trump style, which is a little different than me, but of a, sol of a solid kind of Sunni alliance with the U.S. against mm -hmm. what they believe are the more radical uh, intonations or, you know, in inclinations of the Iranians and, and some of their uh, sponsors in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And the Saudis embraced this uh, wholeheartedly. This is what they were really looking for, not the oil problem. That's a long-run problem that they're, they're working on themselves. But, but the, you know, we got 3,000 oil producers in the U.S. We're not, we can't make an agreement with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that takes me to the next question, is that uh, it was it the right decision? Is, is, are they taking the right course of action now in terms of their own interests, their own economic interests, or should they be, and what would you advise them? Should they be raising, lowering prices from where they are now? Is OPEC doing the right thing uh, for its own interest? So that's a good question. I think that um, the interest among all the OPEC participants is not the same. And the Saudis, which have a vast uh, oil uh, reserves and resources, uh, they can actually get by with a lower oil price, and some of the other participants cannot. So it is not in the soil. It is not in the Saudi interest for the price of oil to be a hundred dollars, because at a hundred dollars, the rate of world economic growth slows mm -hmm. and. The substitution away from petroleum occurs at a very fast rate. Mm -hmm. So they've realized that. Now, for the Saudis, they think the Goldilocks price is like 65 or 70, but they're having a hard time getting there. And they're going to have to do major, major reforms within Saudi society if they're going to survive at $50 a barrel. Mm -hmm. What about going down? I mean, you alluded to the effect on the world economy. If prices get too high, that slows the world economy. But suppose uh, they go to 40 or who knows what, something below 50. Uh, would that accelerate the world economy? Is that what we need? So it depends on whether all the participants in the world economy think it's a long-run shift or just a short-run shift. You know, we had this problem in the U.S. The traditional view was if oil prices fall and uh, American consumers save a dollar, they run out and spend two, right? That's what they, we thought was going to happen. In the 2014 downturn, where we had this massive decline, in oil prices, and literally overnight, $75 billion in upstream oil investment disappeared in the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. But consumers saved a lot more than that. We did not see the bump because we were still in the post-financial crisis era, and consumers decided to take that money and pay down their debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that, it, you know, it started to come back later on. We started to see more spending, more vehicle miles traveled, things like that. But it was not the usual boom we see from falling oil prices. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one thing that occurs to me uh, is that, uh, and you alluded to this also, that, that these, um, that, that, that the pressure holding the OPEC price down actually has a negative effect on policy to develop renewables in this country and probably elsewhere. Um, yes. And how does that work? What's the linkage and what, well, what do you this predict? Is a, this is a kind of traditional dilemma uh, in economics because 
people say it's terrible. We would be better off if oil prices were 100. Well, that's not exactly true. <laughs> if prices of oil was 100, we would be a lot poorer, and we would take our less money that we have and start to look for ways to find alternatives. Sure. But that's a very costly strategy. I don't think people in Hawaii would be really dancing in the streets if they found out jet fuel doubled and the price of gasoline was $7 a gallon. <laughs> so look, the upside of this is so. we can all ride bikes now. I don't think that's actually what people are trying to get out of this. <laughs> and this is the problem. People, people kind of do want their cake and eat it too. <laughs> yeah, right. You can't eat your cake. Have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> Lou, it's wonderful to talk to you. I so appreciate these discussions. I look forward to uh, the, our next time two weeks from today, and I and I will also uh, look forward and try to make plans for your trip in, in late August. I'm we looking definitely forward to get together. You, <laughs> Thanks Bye. so much.